Covington Vineyard Church. Welcome to our first communion of 2021. One of the most powerful themes of the New Testament, which follows whispers in the Old Testament, is the union of God and His people as a marriage relationship. The consummation of that union will be this wedding feast, what's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in the Gospel of Mark chapter 2, Jesus alludes to Himself as the bridegroom. This is in response to a question about fasting. And so what we learn from the word here is that we fast now because the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, is not here with us physically. And so we fast until that day when we come to that great banquet. And what we're doing now, today, and thereafter, is a pointer. It's a signpost to that great wedding feast to come when we're in the kingdom in its fullness. Now, as we begin this new year around the Lord's table, I want to echo words from the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 about not taking communion, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, in an unworthy manner. So this is a good time at the start of a year to take stock and think of this teaching afresh. And so I wonder, do you long for His appearing? Do you long for that wedding feast? If not, and you're not able to come to Him in repentance and faith, for, in response to whatever distance or sin in your life, then it's good for you at certain times to not partake of the Lord's Supper. We ought not to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, Paul says. And so it may actually be appropriate, appropriate for you to abstain from Holy Communion for a particular month or season. And, and if that's you, can I just encourage you to talk with someone, talk to an elder, talk to your home group leader, talk to one of us pastors about how we can help prepare you to take Holy Communion in the near future. Well, to prepare our hearts to come before this merciful God in, in repentance and faith, Let's say this prayer of confession together. Holy and merciful God, you have given us a new year full of promise and grace, and yet already we have sinned against you. Instead of helping to prepare your way, we have too often gone our own way. Instead of sharing, we have hoarded. Instead of being content with your gifts, we have complained. Instead of resisting the evil one and trusting in your word, we have given in and sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Our only hope is in Jesus, who perfectly resisted temptation and trusted in his heavenly Father. Because of his self-sacrificial love, we have hope. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. For Christ's sake, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer of confession with a sincere heart. Know that our Savior has heard your confession. He loves you and He forgives you. So rest in the knowledge of that grace today. Now let's just take a few moments individually to continue examining our hearts before the Lord. The Apostle Paul passed down what he received from the Lord. That on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread together. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, This 
is the blood of the new covenant. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's drink the cup together. Amen. And church, you said that whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord, would you confirm in our hearts, seal by the power of your Holy Spirit, what we've been partaking of in these elements. Lord, the mystery of how you draw near by your Spirit as we partake of this sacrament. So Lord, I pray that for those who perhaps did not partake because they're in a place of maybe confusion or just struggle where their heart is distant from you and they're not coming in repentance. Lord, I pray that you would bring them to that point of repentance to Lord, where they can feast in this meal as a pointer to that great feast to come. Lord, we thank you for the hope and promise of that day. And we thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, hello again, church. And for those of you who are watching who may not be part of LVC, my name is Jeremy Cook, and I serve as one of the pastors here. This week on Thursday morning, I woke up to something quite shocking. And it led me to think, okay, Lord, here we are in this month of a focus on prayer especially praying together as a body, and today's sermon on fasting and prayer. And so I woke up on Thursday morning, and like many Americans who saw the news of what happened on Wednesday at the United States Capitol, I was shocked and dismayed, sadly not all completely surprised at what had gone on, but also just confused and embarrassed. I don't know about how other Americans feel, but it's actually a fairly embarrassing time to be an American. As the People's Daily talked about here in Nairobi, it was definitely America's shame. When I was a university student, I had the privilege of serving as an intern in the United States Senate. And as part of that role from time to time when constituents from the home state would come to DC and visit the senator's office. I would take them on a private tour of the US Capitol, which is thought of as the people's house. And I was proud of the fact that I could take them on this private tour to show them things that the general public did not see. And one of those things that I would take them up this stairwell to upper parts of the US Capitol where along that stairwell, I could show them bayonet marks that are still there from the bayonets of British soldiers who invaded the U.S. Capitol in 1814. So however many years later, those are still there. It was the last time the U.S. Capitol was invaded. But on Wednesday, it was invaded by a mob of United States citizens. And I I was told by my oldest son what had happened. And so then I, sure enough, I looked and I saw, and for about two hours, I actually lost about half the day in total distraction. But for about two hours, looked at my news feed, Facebook feed, and was just shocked and saddened and frustrated and angry. And see, what I'm going to be talking about today when it comes to fasting and prayer is that from the Bible, what we see is that Fasting is in response to a circumstance. And in fact, it's two main things in response to a crisis or a crossroad. And I certainly looked and I thought, this is a crisis moment for my passport country. Now, church, let me just speak very honestly. I'm sharing a bit personally this morning in this introduction. And I got to confess that I feel a bit self-conscious as a pastor of a church of 25 nationalities to, to share this specifically about an event in my country. And in part because a lot of times Americans, we can, we can suck up a lot of the oxygen in the room. But the reality is also that 
the United States has a lot of say and influence in the world. And when something like this happens, a lot of people perk up and pay attention. In fact, most probably. In our church of 25 nationalities, Americans are the second largest nationality after Kenyans. And I know a lot of fellow Americans are just looking at this saying, God, what is happening to our country? You know, whether it's in the United States or Senegal or Kenya or Myanmar, when the issues of injustice, when it goes from just being shocked to what can happen surrounding elections, but it goes to this issue of injustice, it goes a lot deeper. And this is part of where it hit me personally. You see, because not only did our president, who's thought of as the leader of the free world, incite this violent mob to go and attack the people's house. You see, what happened was you have a juxtaposition of two different responses. So as I looked at this and I thought about the fact that months ago, during some protests where rioting happened, looting happened, and that was wrong and sad. But when you have a crowd of people, many of whom look like my teenage kids, and who as a group are mostly of a particular political persuasion, and the response when a world leader says in response to that, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. But then this week, when the crowd, the mob of U.S. citizens who invaded the people's house, the U.S. Capitol, made up of mostly people who look like me, this was the response. Beforehand, this leader said, you'll never take back our country with weakness. And then went on to say in response to the riots, go home. We love you. You're very special. See, when I hold those two things up, there is injustice there. It is wrong and it is evil. In church, it could be whether what happens in your passport country or here in Kenya, maybe some of you Kenyans, and those of us who, who live here and call Kenya our home, we're already thinking about 2022. There's already some fears about what could happen. There's a lot of drama already. And these kind of things lead us to say, okay, God, we have to press in in prayer. And church, what I want to lay before us today, with whatever crisis or crossroad we're looking at, whether it's a global issue, a national issue, or very individual, is that fasting is this gift from God. That we take alongside prayer and we say, God, we are hungry for you. We need you desperately. And so when we come to these crises or crossroads, and maybe the word crisis for you might feel too strong for what you're going through right now. Maybe it's just a challenge. But nonetheless, we come to this place where we don't know what to do. And the fact is we cannot rely on ourselves. And so we get fasting as a gift from God, because in that place where we don't know what to do, we could feel paralyzed, literally stuck in our actions. We don't know what decisions to make. Or we ignore God and we pursue wrong paths because we say, God, you're just not coming through for me. I don't know where you are. Or we wallow in confusion or bitterness. We, we look at like something that happened in my country. It happens in our, our home countries, our passport countries, and we just get so frustrated and angry and bitterness and confusion can come. And so in light of this problem that we all face, when we just we don't know what to do, practice fasting with prayer, brother or sister in Christ. Practice fasting with prayer because you're hungry for God. I need to practice fasting with prayer because I'm hungry for God. And that is is the response. I'm going to talk about how action, that doesn't mean that we just over-spiritualize it and say, oh, I'm just going to pray, you know, thoughts and prayers with you, thoughts and prayers for that situation. But know that, Lord, I need to be with you and hear from you and hunger for you and your ways and then take action. 
And so, church, to receive this gift, we need to practice it. We need to learn how to use it. In fact, we need to understand the purpose of it. Why does it even exist? So think of a a child who gets a bicycle for Christmas or if they're really blessed and their parents are very generous or Santa is very generous, they get this piano. What an amazing gift. But maybe they have no idea how to ride the bicycle or play the piano and they have to learn how to use it. They have to practice to get to that point where there is joy and it just flows. Well, so we need to understand the purpose of it. When it comes to fasting as a Christian, why does it even exist? So the first thing that I want you to understand, okay, is we think about the need to practice fasting. Practice fasting with prayer because we're hungry for God in response to when we don't know what to do. The first thing I want us to understand is that Christians fast because we're waiting for a feast. Christians fast because we're waiting for a feast. So in Mark chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came to him and said, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Then they will fast in that day. So if you were part of taking communion with us, I alluded to this earlier. Where Jesus is saying, because you know what? Someone could come to you and say, hey, why don't you fast? Well, that's basically the question they got. Why don't don't you and your disciples fast? And Jesus tells them this parable of sorts to show them, to allude to the fact that he is this bridegroom. And it would be so inappropriate for them to fast. You see, because the Pharisees, like we see throughout the New Testament, they fast because it makes them look really good. It's this religious ritual that helps them to feel better about themselves and to look good in front of others. But Jesus says it actually would be entirely inappropriate for my disciples to fast because the bridegroom is here. Imagine here in Kenya or elsewhere on this continent where weddings and wedding feasts are a really big deal. Imagine you saw someone at the wedding when it was time to get up from the table and go to the buffet line or to be served by the the wait staff. And this person said, oh, no, no thanks. I'm not going to eat at this wedding because I'm fasting. I mean, you'd look at them and be like, what is wrong with you? That is so lame. That is so inappropriate. Well, that's what Jesus is saying. He says, they will fast in that day. That day will come. And so church, now in 2021, we're still in that in-between time between the first and the second advent. And we look forward to that second advent when he comes and the kingdom comes in fullness and we sit at that wedding feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Fasting will be done at that point. Will be no more. There will be no more use for it. But now when we fast, there's an assumption in the New Testament that his followers fast. It is to increase our longing. The author, John Piper, who wrote a book called A Hunger for God, which is what I've titled this sermon. I just stole the title from him. He writes that fasting is a periodic and sometimes decisive declaration that we would rather feast at God's table in the kingdom of heaven than feed on the finest delicacies of the world. I love that. A declaration. I don't know if you knew that's what fasting is in part. I think John Piper's right here. By the way, this book, I don't know of any other, uh, a better book on fasting. The good news is as well that John Piper gives his books away for free. So if you follow the link in the show notes or on our Facebook page, you can download the PDF for free. You could read it devotionally if you want to just dive in more on this topic. It's an amazing book. And so it's this declaration that, God, I want you more than even the finest delicacies in the world. In Luke chapter 2, we get a, a bit of a picture of this. 
when after Jesus' birth and when he's eight days old, his parents bring him to the temple to be consecrated. There's this old man, Simeon, and this old woman, Anna. And Anna is a prophetess. There are a few Annas who in this life I didn't get to meet, who I look forward to meeting in heaven. And one of them is this Anna, a prophetess, who is there fasting and praying in the temple. She had been widowed for probably around 60 years. She's 84 years old. She only lived with her husband for seven years until she became a widow. But Anna is here longing for the kingdom to come. And as this little baby, eight days old, comes... She realizes this is him. This is it. The kingdom is here because the king is here. So she goes around in the temple to all these people, telling them, those who were waiting, who were longing for the kingdom of God. What a picture. David Mathis, the author, writes that Christian fasting is not mainly about what we go without, but who we want more of. I wonder what your hunger is today. Are you hungry for some kind of independence? Maybe a certain notion of of freedom that you think is out there somewhere. But actually freedom is in here in your heart. As your God draws draws near to you and you long for him. And you hunger for his presence. Maybe for you... What you're longing for right now is just to make it through each day. Maybe on day 10 of January, you're already exhausted. Maybe you're just longing to make it through the day. And so food and drink and entertainment just helps you get through the day. And when you can get your head on that pillow, hope you, hopefully you have a good night of sleep. Or maybe you're just waiting to the next vacation. So what are you hungry for? Okay, so maybe you're asking, but when do I fast? I understand that the heart, the, the why fasting even exists for a Christian. But when do I fast? You may be wondering, what, what relevance does it have to my individual life? So the second thing I want us to understand is that Christians fast when we're facing a crisis or a crossroad. So in Scripture, fasting is circumstantial. There is no command in the New Testament. I'll talk more a bit about that in a second. But first, we see this modeled by Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 4, when he starts his ministry, he is in the desert being tempted by Satan himself. And Matthew is very specific that after, being, after fasting for 40 days, he was hungry. And so, of course, first thing Satan tempts him, tempts him with is hunger, saying... If you are the Son of God, if you really are, then tell these stones to become bread. And how does Jesus respond? He fights with the word. He says, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus is at this crisis point of sorts when he's tempted for 40 days by Satan himself. You could say it's a crossroads where he's going out on this strategic ministry. And so he fasts. And praise. Well, then in the early church in Acts chapter 13, when the church in Antioch wants to send off Barnabas and Saul on a missionary journey, it says they are fasting and praying. And in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit speaks and says, Set apart Barnabas and Saul. Well, in the next chapter, chapter 14, Barnabas and Paul, now called Paul by Luke, they are appointing elders in the churches. And so they fast and pray as they appoint these elders. So we have these examples in the New Testament. But then you may be wondering still, okay, I understand the assumption. I see the model and the example, but how is it actually done? You may still be confused by the practice, perhaps because you've known some who were very pharisaical, very legalistic about fasting. Well, this third thing I want us to understand is that Christians fast with grace and freedom. So as I said, there is no command anywhere in the New Testament to fast. In fact, there are very few, relatively very few references to fasting. But there's this assumption. And so in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying to his disciples, when you fast. And he's contrasting this with the Pharisees, who they so want to be recognized 
for their religiosity, including how they fast, that they, they disfigure their faces, they just make themselves look like they're suffering so that other people think really highly of them. And Jesus says, no. No, we're actually to be private about the way we fast. Because your Heavenly Father, who sees what's done in secret, He will reward you. And so there are these two principles that we need to understand of privacy and reward. So it's not bad, even just as I want to share with you today a little bit of what I've experienced this week, to share testimonies with each other of what you're learning. But if there's any inkling, we should always check our motive. Any inkling of, I want to look really good by talking about fasting. The rule of thumb is we keep it as private as possible. Well, then Jesus is so clear that your heavenly father will reward you. When I was eight years old, in 1983, my family and I lived in Utah, snowy Utah. And one winter, for some reason, I had this idea that I wanted to make a few dollars. And so I sat, set out on my own. I don't even think I told my mom set out on my own to knock on a few neighbors' doors and say, hey, could I shovel your driveway so they could get their car out of the driveway um, for a few dollars? And so I ended up shoveling a few driveways. I don't even remember. But I went home with $10. Now, for an 8-year-old in 1983, that was a lot of money, the equivalent of a 1,000 shillings. It's a lot of money for a lot of people in this world today. And I was so happy that I had this $10. Well, a few hours later, when my father got home from work, he found out what I had done. And he came to me and said, Jeremy, I'm going to match your $10. Here's $10. And I had $20 as an eight-year-old kid. Now, church, some 38 years later, I don't remember what I bought. It was probably candy or some toys that I played with for a month and then forgot about. But what I remember is how my father was proud of me and how he rewarded me. So yes, there is a reward. Now we may not know what it is and it may be different from what you expect or want. So different from what the prosperity gospel teachers would say to you. But the truth in scripture is that your father will reward you. That is a beautiful benefit of fasting. Well, now let's get a bit practical now at this point. One definition of fasting that I like is by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who said, and this is paraphrasing here, that it's to abstain. Fasting is abstinence from legitimate things, things that are legitimate in and of themselves for some spiritual, special spiritual purpose. So abstaining from legitimate things for some special purpose spiritual purpose. So the obvious one is food. That's what we see in scripture. I think it's what most people experience. Of course, there is fasting from food and, and other religions. But the key things here that I want you to, to grasp practically as you consider even this month as we seek to fast together as a church as we start this new year is to think in two ways about what you choose. Number one is that it reorients your mind and your heart as your body is engaged. We are holistic creatures. And so as we fast, it's about reorienting our heart and our mind as our body very practically maybe feels hunger or, or some other kind of withdrawal or physical reminder. And so we begin to think, oh yes, there's something I'm doing here on purpose. But then the second thing is that it creates time and space to then actually pray. Christian fasting is always about prayer. It's not just fasting for the sake of doing it, certainly not to, to say that I'm doing it or just to feel good that I'm doing it, but it's to create time and space for prayer, to be with the Lord, to be in his word, to be interceding. So let me say a couple quick practical things about some items that you might choose. So there's food. Now, drink could be there for you as well. Maybe uh, drinking alcohol. You may not face an addiction with alcohol, but perhaps in drinking with friends and family, to abstain from that for whatever period of time would actually help reorient your heart and your mind and maybe even free up time and space for you. But for many food, I mean, most of us are eating two to three square meals a day. And so it might be that you fast for one meal a day, 
or excuse me, yeah, for one meal out of the day for every day over the course of this month. That's actually what I'm doing right now. So Tuesday, I started fasting breakfast. And so I'm not eating anything up until lunch. And one quick little testimonial, church, is that I experienced something interesting. Because throughout most of COVID, I've been trying to exercise and stay healthy and lose some of those COVID kgs. And so what I've been doing during even earlier than this fast is not eating breakfast. So that hopefully as I'm on that exercise bike, I'm burning some fat. Well, what I noticed on Tuesday is that I am, as I'm fasting for a spiritual purpose, to sit there in my chair and be praying more, and to really be engaging with the Lord, it was more of a struggle. We are funny creatures, how psychologically, as holistic beings, there was something happening when I was doing this for just pure exercise, and now when I'm doing it for spiritual fasting. Now look, here's a challenge for you, because many of you perhaps in this new year, after the COVID KGs and the Christmas COVID KGs with all the mince pies and cookies and chapatis, maybe you're already dieting, maybe even doing some kind of specialized fast. But can I encourage you, don't just tack on God, don't just tack on prayer and spirituality onto what you're already doing. Now, it could be a bonus that uh, as a benefit, it's helping with the diet, it's helping with weight loss. But don't think of fasting as just a tack on to your weight loss program. So it could be that you're fasting one meal a day each day, or it could be that you're fasting for an entire day each week over the course of this month. Maybe it's fasting an entire week. And if you've never fasted for more than a few days, let me just encourage you. Because there is this grace and freedom in that spirit, let me just encourage you, if you're gonna fast for a longer period of time, to talk to your doctor and just find out for your body, how is that going to be? And what what do you need to be watching out for? And look, because there is grace and freedom, if you are trying fasting, if you're not used to it, if you're out of practice, When it comes to food, if you're experiencing illness, physical struggle, okay, don't listen to the voices that say, oh, you're just lacking faith. You know, if you're really a strong Christian, you'll just, you know, you'll power through it. Look, on Tuesday, I started experiencing a headache. And I was able to say, okay, I'm going to drink a lot of water. I'm just going to try to make it through. I, I took a Panadol to help with that headache, but I was able to make it until lunch. But look, there could be times this month where I really just need to even eat a handful of nuts to give me some protein. Look, there is grace and freedom. We're not under the law. So maybe for you, it's not food. Maybe it's entertainment, Netflix, TV, YouTube. Withdrawing from that, abstaining from it for certain periods of time, maybe even a whole month could be really good for you. Social media apps, could certainly cause you to reorient your heart and your mind, but then certainly to free up time and space to be with the Lord. Or tools, maybe a smartphone. For a lot of us, this would be really hard because we use this device for work. But perhaps for you, you're able to just set it aside for certain periods of time. And that may be really good for you to reorient your mind and create the time and that space. So church, we're in another pandemic year. Um, maybe you're already in day 10 and you're just thinking, Lord, is this still 2020? It's day 10 and I'm already exhausted. There is a lot of uncertainty, a lot of indecision. We don't know what's going to happen as kids have gone back to school and we don't know what's going to happen with this virus after the holidays, the spread of it. We're saying, Lord, we need you. We need to seek your face. We need to hunger for him, church, and to, to cry out. Whether it's a a global issue, I mean, whether it's a, an individual issue, something very particular to you. Let's go after his presence and use this gift. In the Cook family, we have this Christmas morning tradition where one of the kids get to, gets to pick the Santa hat and pa- pass out all the gifts from under the Christmas tree to every person. Well, I, I wish I could be like that Santa, put on that Santa hat and and pass out this gift to you that you would receive with joy. But forget Santa. We have this amazing Heavenly Father who loves to give 
good gifts and he knows exactly what we need. A couple months ago, when I did my define the relationship walk with God, in response to that Hosea sermon, I had said, okay, I'm going to go out in Karura. I'm going to do my walk and spend time with the Lord, talking about how are we doing? Where are we at, Lord? And as I started that walk, there weren't many people in Karura. And within the first five minutes, I came across a troop of colobus monkeys up in the trees. Now, I've seen a number of monkeys in Karura Forest, wherever I am, but I've never seen colobus monkeys. And I stood there in awe with so much joy and even just a very private giddiness. No one was around to see me just laughing out loud and saying, God, you are so good. This is such a gift. I stood there for five minutes and just watched this group of monkeys just right off the path. You know, I wonder if for you, you would come across, I mean, maybe monkeys to you are no big deal. But I wonder if you would come across, whether it's colobus monkeys in Karura Forest or something else and just think, eh, whatever. Eh, they're just monkeys or it's just that little gift. Because you have so entrenched in your mind what you think the gifts or the blessings from God should be. And your perfect Heavenly Father is saying, I want to come to you, my child, even with a small gift to bring you joy. Do you have eyes to see? Do you have ears to hear? Do you have a heart that is open and ready to receive from him? Or are you so convinced that you know what you need? Look, when it comes to some of these practical things, I'm so concerned for some of us that it's day 10 and we're already exhausted. Maybe it's because of you're an American and you saw what happened in the U.S. and you're just already angry and frustrated and exhausted. Can I just encourage you, press in. You may think, no, what I need to do is take action. Yes, you need to take action. We need to speak out. We need to be involved. As 2022 approaches, as different issues come up in Kenya and here in Nairobi, we need to be involved and take action. But I want to challenge you to receive this gift of fasting along with prayer to say, God, I need to press in and I need to, re I need to receive from you, my Father. And so it's that you can have those reserves and the power to go out and to take action. Church, we have a perfect Heavenly Father who gives us this gift. So let's use it and let's watch and see what He does. Let's pray. God, would you make us like a little child? Childlike faith to stand on our tiptoes, trying to see, as it were, through the window. It's something that's happening that's glorious and exciting and meant for our joy. But would you forgive us for how dull our senses could get, even for the way that we allow gifts like food and drink and art and entertainment to dull our senses, to cause us to lose appetite for you. Holy Spirit, would you come and change our hearts? Would you make us ready to receive more of you, Holy Spirit? So therefore we can go out and be part of what you're doing to bring shalom to Nairobi and Washington, D.C and Moscow, and Beijing, and Paris. God, we need you. Church, I want to invite you to, after this video is done, to go and take a look at this song that Toru has done, making harmony with his own voice so beautifully. And in this song called, O oh God Beyond All Praising, this line that says, and whether our tomorrows be filled with good or ill, we'll triumph through our sorrows and rise to bless you still, to marvel at your beauty and glory in your ways and make a joyful duty our sacrifice of praise. You go check it out in the show notes. Listen to that song, Worship Together with Toru. Or then go and listen to the song, Even So Come. 
even so come. Lord, let us be a church that's waiting for you. We're ready for you. May we be that church, LVC. Love you. We'll see you in the next video. Thank you.